Hello friends, welcome to another real-time painting Q&A video. Over on my Patreon and Instagram, I asked you guys to leave me some questions to answer for today's voiceover while I painted this watercolor portrait. For many of my illustrations, I sketch it digitally in Procreate on my iPad, print it out, and trace it onto the watercolor paper using a light pad. So similar to my previous Q&A videos, all the footage you see is in real time, but I did edit out, edit out any redundant footage of me blow drying in between layers or anything that was extra repetitive or I'm just like idly staring at the page. Um, and so yeah, I think including the sketch, the drying time and painting this piece, uh, it probably took closer to three hours or so, whereas uh, I've edited it down so that we are looking at more like an hour. That way it's a little bit more digestible for you guys. So this is my third Q&A video. So uh, there is a pretty good chance that if you don't hear your question answered here in this video, I might have already answered it in the previous videos. And similarly, uh, any questions related to specific art supplies, growing your social media and developing your art style have all been left out because I have separate videos for each of those topics that I've dis uh, discussed in length already. All of these videos will be linked in the description down below along with all of the art supplies you'd used in today's video. Oh, and I'd like to say that the inspiration for this piece was from uh, this really cool snake tiara that was featured in the Valentino Spring 2016 collection, if I am reading this correctly. So yeah, I, I found, I came across it on Pinterest and I just, I love snake motifs and being a Slytherin, I thought that a kind of dark emerald hair with it would look pretty cool. Okay, now with that out of the way, let's answer some questions. So first question, how are you? Recently, I have actually been feeling pretty drained. I feel like I am trying to provide as much content as possible, but it just never feels like enough. But uh, on the flip side, I am extremely grateful and excited about how my Patreon launch has been going. And I do have a couple of exciting collaborations and partnerships lined up for next month that I'm really looking forward to. So generally I am doing pretty good, all things considered. Um, I'm just, I think, experiencing a touch of burnout, but I think it'll be okay. Um, yeah. By the way, thank you guys so, so much to everyone who has joined my Patreon page so far. I am really blown away at how well it's been going and you guys are really, really sweet. How is your routine during quarantine? I've been able to maintain a fairly consistent routine during uh, this this quarantine. It's been, we're going on like our third month now. Um, and I say consistent by my own standards. It's probably pretty unstructured to most people, but basically most days I will wake up around 9 a.m. I'll shower, eat breakfast, watch a TV show um, while I eat breakfast. And then basically from 11 a.m until 11 p.m. I will periodically kind of back and forth work and take breaks throughout the day. And it will, it depends on uh, the day, but my, you know, workflow will consist of various things uh, such as checking my social media, replying to emails, recording a YouTube video, editing a YouTube video, uh, drawing and painting, packing shop orders, going to the post office, etc. Um, and of course, um, there will also be days where I have to do house chores or errands like laundry or groceries. And don't worry, I know a 12 hour day sounds kind of intense, but I do make a point to take a break to eat lunch and dinner. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, it, sounds, it sounds intense, but I've gotten used to it. <laughs> Thank you. 
How do you keep calm during lockdown? I manage to keep myself occupied pretty much at any given moment. There is always something that needs to be done. And so keeping busy, I think, helps me keep focused and feeling productive. I feel like if I spend too much time being idle, then uh, that's when um, any kind of worry or stress can um kind of leak in but obviously it's not a perfect system and if i'm only human so it's uh inevitable that i kind of go through ups and downs like everybody else what is one of your long-term art goals So I'm sure you guys are probably sick of hearing me say this, but obviously my main goal right now is to become a full-time artist. But if we're thinking beyond that, uh, something that I would be interested in doing down the road would be to have a solo show in a gallery internationally. I technically had my first solo show here in Toronto back in, I think, 2018. It definitely wasn't perfect and... uh, But now that um, I've done it, I think I have a better idea of what to expect and what I'd do differently if I were to do a solo show uh, in a gallery again. And additionally, I think I'd rather have an exhibition somewhere in the States for a couple reasons. Um, One, I've heard that the kind of more illustrative slash quote unquote lowbrow art scene is way more prevalent in major cities in the United States in comparison to here in Toronto and Canada. Secondly, I believe that the majority of you guys, my audience, um, is in the States as well. Um, Not that I don't appreciate my Canadian following an international audience, of course, but statistically um, from my shop sales and my social media followings, the majority of you guys are Americans. So I feel like having an exhibition in America would make the most sense because then I could, you know, reach as many of you as possible. I wanted to ask, what would you recommend to someone who's a beginner painter? I get this question a lot. So here it is. Art mediums are not a one size fits all. There are not clear cut levels of hardness or something that inherently makes one easier than another. Every artist is different. I have a friend who finds watercolors and gouache very difficult. But I personally have, have have a really hard time with oil paint. At least when I tried it, I found it was really, really difficult. And that has less to do with our skill level and more about the way that we as artists like to work. So if you're interested in painting but don't know which medium you want to get into, ask yourself what kind of paintings are you interested in making? Look at the art and artists that you enjoy the most. What mediums do they use? What is it about the way that they use those mediums that speak to you? It's not about what's going to be easier for a beginner. It's more about what kind of look do you want your paintings to have? How do you find the will to make art in these times where you can easily see people's work that are better than your own? So of course we are all guilty of comparing our work to other artists. I'm definitely guilty of that as well. I know that it is much easier said than done, but really like don't try not to compare yourself to others and try not to feel competitive with your fellow artists. I think that's a a level um, that we have to like peel back is this sense of um, competition and, you know, don't concern yourself with how old they are or how short amount of time they've been Uh, making artwork or whatever it is that you're agonizing over and comparing yourself at a you know micro level but rather focus on yourself and why it is that you want to make artwork in the first place are you only making artwork because you want to be praised by strangers on the internet if that's the case then you kind of have to reevaluate why you're doing it but, you know, if you if you look at the core reason why you make artwork, is it because you enjoy the process and you find it fun? Like then that should be what drives you rather than, oh, my artwork doesn't look as good as so and so's or whatever. 
what are your go-to warm-up methods? So I actually don't warm up very often, but I do hope to get into a better habit of it. I got really inspired by Cosmic Spectrum, who has been posting real-time videos of her doing warm-up figure sketches in her sketchbook. So I hope to do that more as well, especially since I still need a lot of practice with drawing figures and I just feel like I need to kind of go back and continue to solidify my foundation on drawing figures and um, yeah. So warm ups is definitely something that I need to do more often. <laughs> What got you into watercolors? I think it must have been when I was in my late teens and at that point I had been mainly using color pencils and fine liners. I desperately wanted to use Copic markers because that was what all the manga artists that I admire had been using, but I could not afford them nor were they accessible to me at the time. Um, during those days, online shopping was not really a thing. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think I guess at one point I must have been in an art supply store and uh, decided that watercolors might be a more affordable alternative. Uh, I remember the very first watercolors that I had, of course, excluding when I was like a toddler, um, was a 12 color pan set from Reeves. Um, they, yeah, they were very well loved. Um, I have since given them away, of course, cause I don't really have a use for them anymore, but yeah, I, yeah, that's where it all started. How do you find the balance between tedious nature of some works and being free and creative on the spot? I find that the repetitiveness of some aspects of watercolor just discourages me from painting slash drawing. So I actually don't know if I have the perfect answer for this question. Um, I find that I personally am definitely the type of artist that works very tediously. The majority of my work is quite clean and crisp and I have a very specific vision for what I want it to look like. I actually often envy artists who can work so loosely because I feel like there's just so much energy and life in that kind of uh, approach of painting. So if you are looking to loosen up your uh, approach, I would definitely check out Lee Elson. Uh, she has uh, an Instagram and a new and as well as a YouTube channel. Um, her work is amazing and I feel like she is the perfect example of an artist who has a very loose kind of energetic approach to painting and drawing. But if you do want to try and do both, uh, I guess a really good option would be to have a sketchbook that you're not super attached to and then um, use that to get looser or um, have kind of a low low pressure um, place to, to work in. How to draw a real person but in your style and how to get the likeness of the person without being a copy slash paste of the actual photo. So uh, I do get a, f an, a fair a number of questions about stylization and I think the key to stylizing a portrait but still capturing the likeness of a real person is you want to emphasize or pay attention to their features that make um, that person unique or recognizable. So for example, take this photo of Rihanna that I recently painted. Um, so when, when I look at this photo, when I look at Rihanna, I find that her defining features are her very sharp Cupid's bow on her upper lip and the shape of her nose. I think those are the features of her that are the most unique to her. And so even though of course my rendition of uh, of her is definitely stylized and not an exact realism replica, keeping those key features in mind, I think helps keep her likeness. What is your favorite thing about your own art style and what are you working on improving? 
So the favorite thing about my work, which is less about style and more about subject, but my favorite thing is when someone finds my work and feels seen and represented. And moving forward, I want to continue to push for diversity in the artwork that I make. That is kind of the driving force be behind the reason why I choose to paint so many different portraits of women because I want to try and make women feel empowered and seen. So that's, yeah, so that's more of a, yeah, that's more of a subject thing and less of a style thing. Is there any art supply that you really want to try but never did? As you guys might have already been able to tell if you have been following me for a little bit, I have tried and used quite a wide array of art supplies fairly regularly, but an art medium, um, I guess less of a supply but more of a medium, that I've been really curious about is ceramics. Of course, this is something that I can't just pick up casually. It requires a lot of um, kind of equipment and space. And um, but I I think when whenever the pandemic is finally over or whatever, um, I would love to take some ceramic classes and try to make some cute pots and trays. I I just think it's so it's just so fun looking um, and it's so different from what, of course, the, the kind of work that I actually make. So I think that would be a really fun challenge uh, to take up one of these days. What advice would you give to someone who wants to make money from their art and dreams of being a full-time artist, but has very little influence via social media? All right, this is a humongous question, but I'm going to try and answer it as concisely as possible. Um, so while I do think that having a social media following can definitely be really helpful, it is definitely not absolutely necessary. For me though, social media has been pretty vital to most of my success as an artist. So the advice that I'm going to give is just kind of um, based on my experience. So yeah, growing my following has allowed me to reach a wide audience that will purchase my work, watch my videos, and as well get noticed by companies and brands that want to work with me for sponsorships, etc. But that being said, there's tons of artists out there who don't prioritize their social media and are still successful. Um, their careers just look very, very different, such as doing freelance work for companies and clients, showing uh, at art galleries, working in-house at a studio, teaching classes, etc. There are tons of different avenues. It's just a matter of figuring out what path makes sense for you and doing the research and putting in the work. Nothing comes easily and there is not only one path. And most of the time as a creative person, you'll probably end up having to juggle multiple different things at once and wear multiple hats. But honestly, like in this day and age, I highly, highly recommend um, putting in at least some effort into a social media following because I think that it really helps open doors. When did you know and fully decide that you wanted to pursue art as a job? I think it was maybe three-ish years ago when I finally decided or settled on my current art career path. Um, as many of you know, I went to school for graphic design, but when I graduated, I chose not to pursue it because after I had done a short internship at a design studio, I realized that it was not what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. However, I did spend many years after school not knowing exactly what it actually was that I wanted to do. I just knew that ultimately I wanted to be able to keep drawing and painting rather than working nine to five at a computer doing design work for somebody else. So for a while, I tried applying to art galleries with little success. 
Uh, and then from there, I had tried out outdoor art markets and fairs, which I saw a little bit more success with. Uh, sometimes I would take on random freelance gigs or I'd do personal commissions, but I didn't really enjoy doing them. And then uh, I think 2015, I had tabled at my very first anime convention and that was definitely like a breakthrough moment, I think. Um, but yeah, after all these different avenues and kind of trying out all these different things, it kind of finally clicked for me that the type of career that I wanted, um, I realized that I did not enjoy being creatively constrained to someone else's vision, um, AKA certain freelance jobs, doing personal commissions, etc. It just wasn't fulfilling and I found it to be quite dry. And whenever I would have to, you know, paint someone and their boyfriend, it just felt like such a chore. So yeah, tabling at anime slash comic conventions was like quite, you know, decent financially and it was really, really fun and rewarding, but I knew that it was not very sustainable since they only come every so often. So basically from there, I had to think about what can I do to earn an income outside of conventions, but is equally or even more fulfilling. And I knew I did not want to have to answer to somebody else or have any of my creativity compromised. So that pretty much came down to me being my own boss and doing everything on my own terms, my own way. That's where eventually I landed on selling my artwork and merchandise online, having a YouTube channel, and just recently now a Patreon page. How did you start selling your art? What advice can you give about opening up your own shop and selling your work? So like I mentioned earlier, I originally started selling my work in person at art markets and conventions. I just went to a local print shop and made prints from there. And then um, at some point I had tried a Society6, which is a platform for artists to sell their artwork, but the website fulfills them for you. The profit margin is really, really small, but I think it is a great stepping stone into seeing if people are actually interested in purchasing your work in the first place before you commit to running your own shop. Because running your own shop and online store is a lot of work and you have to invest in producing the merchandise, whether it's prints, stickers, pins, etc., And then you have to pack and ship out said orders yourself as well. So, if you're unsure of how to go about it, or if you even have an audience that wants to buy your work, I definitely think that something like Society6 or Redbubble in print, one of those kinds of platforms where they do all of the actual work for you, you just have to provide the, the art. That's, I think, a great stepping stone. And then from there, you can evaluate if having your online shop is worth it or when a good time is for it. Have you ever felt like your art was not good enough? 100% all the time. I, I am definitely not immune to feeling insecure about my artwork. I, like I mentioned earlier, I am definitely guilty of comparing my work or where I am in my art career to others. And I can become, you know, frustrated with my limited skill set or just not happy with what my artwork looks like looks like. Um, but for me, I find that it's just not productive to wallow in self pity. I try to turn that energy into motivation to keep improving. If I'm, you know, actually a perfect example of when I finished this portrait that you're watching right now, I was not happy with how her hair turned out. Hair is something that I have a lot of difficulty doing, even though I've been painting portraits, you know, forever. So rather than just, you know, staring at this illustration and being upset about how I didn't like how the hair turned out, I have to turn that energy into the mindset of, okay, so maybe tomorrow and moving forward, I actually need to spend more time focusing on how to improve the way that I render hair. 
that's you know i feel like it's just you're not really doing yourself any favors by um focusing on the negative elements of your work Do your family and friends support your aspiring art career or do they want you to stick with the day job? My relationship to my family overall is quite distant and so most of the time they have no idea what I'm up to. Um, but I will say my mom, while she never forced me to pursue something else, she definitely has made it clear my entire life that she does not think pursuing a creative career to be a logical idea. <laughs> um, even though I have continued to reassure her that with each passing year, I have continued to gain some success. Um, she is very, very skeptical. And honestly, I, I can't blame her, of course. Like she immigrated to Canada so that her kids could pursue stable, comfortable careers. And here I am choosing to go down a very unstable career path. <laughs> so, you know, can't blame her. But I will say my friends are the most supportive people on the freaking planet. I am incredibly grateful to have them in my life. They are always cheering me on whenever I achieve, you know, a goal or hit a milestone. They purchase my merchandise. Um, they've shown up to galleries when my work is being displayed. Honestly, like it's, they're awesome. I'm so happy to have them in my life and I can't wait to see them when uh, we don't have to practice social distancing anymore. <laughs> When you were a kid, what did you tell people you wanted to be when you grew up? Okay, so when I was really, really, really young, for a very, very brief period of time, I said that I wanted to be a doctor, which I have a feeling was probably planted in my head by a family member because I very quickly realized that I would have to deal with uh, you know, injured and sick people and I get squeamish with blood. So changed my mind immediately. Um, and then when I was in my very early high school years, I thought I wanted to be an animator because of my love of animated TV and film, but realized that I would not have the patience for it. So I moved on from that pretty quickly as well. What is something you would tell your younger artist self? I would tell my younger artist self to spend more time doing life drawing and figure studies from actual people. I, I spent the majority of my time in high school um, drawing figures from official anime artwork and fashion magazines, which uh, really makes for a very skewed and stiff knowledge of the human body because of course with anime, it is somebody else's drawing and it's in a very stylized format. And then fashion magazines, while real people, uh, especially back then, a lot of the editorial and supermodels that you see in magazines are all one body type. And there is a way that they, you know, pose and present themselves that's not very natural sometimes or very fluid. And so that's why I think um, my work often suffers from being very, very stiff. And so thankfully I did have some life drawing in college, but I really wish I had taken advantage of it more. And moving forward, I really, like I mentioned earlier, really need to spend more time um, getting back to the basics and doing more figure studies. Do you have any original characters slash stories? If so, do you plan on sharing them anytime soon or make a comic with them? I don't actually. Um, I've mentioned this before, but I've never considered myself to be a writer or narrative storyteller. So it's just never something that um, was really on my radar. Generally, I just find that I'm more of a standalone illustration type artist, even though I do love creating uh, 
character designs. It's just I never really bother to think about giving them a backstory or anything like that. Are you into astrology? Would you ever make an astrology themed piece slash series? I am very casually into astrology. And I say that because um, I definitely don't follow all the ins and outs very closely, but I do find it very interesting. And uh, I just find astrology memes to be freaking hilarious. Um, but yeah, I absolutely would love to make an astrology illustration series. It's actually something that I've been uh, kind of thinking about in the back burner of my brain for quite a while. It's just a matter of finding the time to actually start executing it. Speaking of, what's your rising sign? So my sun sign is Libra, my rising is Virgo, and my moon sign is Leo. I downloaded the app CoStar briefly because I was curious to know what all these signs meant in combination with each other. Uh, and I was, you know, curious about astrology, but I have not really kept up with it. And uh, yeah, so any of you astrology buffs, feel free to read me for that sign combination. <laughs> All right, now we're getting into the fun portion of the Q&A. So what type of genre do you like to read? Also, what would you recommend to people to read? Okay, so unfortunately, I'm not as big of a reader as I wish I was. Um, honestly, I just end up rereading Harry Potter every couple of years. Um, but generally, uh, I do find I enjoy fantasy when I get around to reading. Uh, and I also actually really enjoy autobiography type books from time to time. Uh, like I really enjoyed Mindy Kaling's uh, Tiffany Haddish, and I'm slowly making my way through Lauren Graham's, uh, who played uh Lorelai Gilmore in Gilmore Girls. Um, you know, I, all hilarious female actresses and comedians. Um, I actually, those with those books, I got audio books for them. And uh, yeah, it kind of feels like a podcast basically. But I gotta say, if you have never heard of Tiffany Haddish, she is a hysterical comedian. I feel like a lot of her acting gigs so far really haven't highlighted how funny she actually is. And I really highly recommend her book, The Last Black Unicorn, specifically the audiobook, which is narrated by her, because it basically just feels like an extra long stand up comedy special. And holy crap, not only is she so, so funny, but she has also lived an incredibly hard and fascinating life. She really is a testament to someone who was dealt so many bad hands in her life, but she continued to persevere, work hard, and now she's killing it. And I honestly find that so like inspiring and motivating. So yeah, if you're looking for something of that nature, I definitely recommend it. Favorite movies. It is very hard to narrow down to just one movie because there's just so many different things that I love. I feel like it would be easier to pick a favorite movie from each different genre, <laughs> but um, something that I will never tire of is pretty much the majority of Hayao Miyazaki's animated films. If you've been with me for a little while, you'll know that I dearly love his movies. Kiki's Delivery Service, Howl's Moving Castle, Spirited Away, and Princess Mononoke, just to name a few. And then for films that are not animated, uh, the Lord of the Rings trilogy and the first Jurassic Park come to mind. <laughs> I know, that probably feels very random, but I, they really do like hold up and stand the test of time. The, the Lord of the Rings, funny enough, was actually something that I came into fairly late. When the first one came out in 2001, I was a bit on the younger side and had no interest in it. Uh, my friends actually forced me to watch it and I pretty much just like watched it half like through my fingers because I was so scared of Gollum. And while Gollum, of course, no longer scares me, uh, I'm still pretty easily spooked by actual horror movies. Um, but yeah, he's he's very creepy, that's for sure. <laughs> um, but yeah, it wasn't until I was an adult that I finally gave Lord of the Rings um, a real chance, and now I freaking love them. Uh, and I gotta say, 
Uh, something that really threw me off um, when I finally got around to watching them was I thought, wait, why is Frollo seen as the main character of this trilogy? Uh, I feel like Samwise is the actual hero of the story, <laughs> um, in my in my opinion. Um, and yeah, I guess maybe just from pop culture um, or through the ether, I thought that Frollo served as the center of the story in the same way that Harry Potter does for his um, story. But um, that definitely really isn't the case. I feel like the story, if anything, is actually following Aragorn, uh, which of course I'm not mad at because he's a badass character and he's amazing. Um, I always joke that uh, Aragorn looks his most handsome when he's all like, dirty covered in sweat and blood <laughs> after like a battle i feel like when he's like all cleaned up with like the fluffy hair it just it just doesn't do it for me it's not the same <laughs> as for jurassic park uh i have been watching this movie for a very long time it's it's truly iconic and i'm never not impressed by all of the practical effects I remember being so fascinated watching the behind the scenes footage of how it all came together. Like the large triceratops um, had multiple people manually moving all the different parts or how the velociraptors that chased the kids in the kitchen were actual people dressed in prosthetics. That is amazing. Um, I highly recommend checking out those behind the scenes stuff because it's, it's really fascinating. Um, and I gotta say, I, oh God, I really, really hated the new Jurassic World movie. I felt like it was an abomination. <laughs> and yeah, there was just no point to it. Like why, why, why did we do this? And I mean, don't get me wrong. I like Chris Pratt just fine. Uh, but I think I definitely prefer him as Star-Lord in the Lord of the, uh, not Lord of the Rings, the Guardians of the Galaxy series. He's, yeah, I just prefer him that way. Leave Jurassic World alone. I mean, Jurassic Park. I feel like, yeah, the Jurassic World movies, why, why? Such a money grab. Anyway. <laughs> Last movie you watched. I watched The Princess Bride. I, I can't believe it took me so long to watch it. It is freaking amazing. Like, I fully understand why it's a cult favorite. It's like... The dialogue is hilarious, it's charming and witty, and Wesley, man, he is so dashing. I could not take my eyes away from him. Uh, yeah, I, I really, really enjoyed that one. It's I may or may not have to do some fan art for it at some point. Do you have a celebrity crush? Yes, it's Harry freaking Potter. I mean, Darren Chris. <laughs> if you could only watch three different shows for a year what would they be this is a tough one because i feel like each year you ask me or what what point in my life you ask me it would probably be a different answer but currently um the first the first one of course is avatar the last airbender because Obviously, it's like my favorite show ever. Uh, secondly, I would say Inuyasha because it is such a long anime. So I feel like that's plenty of material to go through. Also, it's what I've been watching all through quarantine. Um, and thirdly, Guillermo Girls because I feel like I need to have a non-animated show in my roster. And I find that with Gilmore Girls, there's something about it that's just very incredibly comforting and fun. And so, yeah, that's that's some that's another one that I would wanna wanna have in my roster. Speaking of Avatar: The Last Airbender, how would you rank the parts of the episode "Tales of Ba Sing Se"? I absolutely love this question and I actually went and watched the episode again so I could give it a very thorough answer. Uh, I've been re-watching Avatar anyway so it was only like a couple episodes off of where I was already. Um, so if you've never seen Avatar The Last Airbender and don't want to hear me ramble on about it you might want to skip ahead a little bit. <laughs> okay so from least favorite to top favorite. So number six The Tale of Aang. Aang has never been my favorite character, so unfortunately, he is in last place. 
Uh, number five, The Tale of Sokka. Alternatively, Sokka actually is one of my favorite characters, but his part in this episode didn't really have any emotional depth and I, it didn't really reveal anything new about his character. So it just felt a little flat. Number four, The Tale of Katara and Toph. On the flip side, I liked this part because we got to see a glimpse of Toph's vulnerability and the positive bond and friendship between her and Katara. I absolutely love seeing healthy female relationships because I feel like we don't get to see a lot of them. Ah, it's nice. The Tale of Momo in number three. I'm always really impressed when a story can be told with no dialogue. I love that we get to see that Momo has emotional intelligence and it just breaks my heart how much he misses Appa. Plus, the reveal of Appa's footprint at the end makes for a really good segue into the next episode. At number two, the tale of Zuko. Zuko is another favorite character of mine, and like the Toph and Katara part, this story allows us to see the softer, more vulnerable side to Zuko. It is especially crucial to see this because in the series up until now, he has been more of a villain. So this starts to reveal that he has more dimensions to him and that he has it in him to be nice and a gentle person. And it's sort of a turning point for him into, um, you know, changing the way that he's always been. At number one, of course, the tale of Iroh. I mean, are we surprised? This absolutely has to be number one. Um, this part of the episode just really truly pulls at your heartstrings. Iroh is an amazing character and seeing him celebrate his late son's birthday is so touching and heartbreaking. It also adds another layer and understanding to his dynamic and relationship with Zuko because we see why Iroh is so protective and paternal towards him. All right, one more Avatar question. <laughs> what kind of bender would you be? This is, I love this. <laughs> you guys are amazing. Um, so if I had the choice, I would love to be a water bender. I think it has the most versatility and the reason for that is because not only can you use it for offense and defense in fight, like in a fight, in a battle, um, but you can also use it to heal and you are not limited to just water. You can freeze it into ice and, you know, on the darker side, you can also use it to blood bend, but, you know, obviously that's immoral and theoretically, I think I would never want to do that. <laughs> If you could live inside any animated movie or series for a day, which would it be? Okay, if I'm being honest, the first thing that comes to mind is Studio Ghibli's Howl's Moving Castle. Everything about that universe, minus the raging war, of course, <laughs> it feels just so whimsical and charming. Plus, I of course love the fantasy and magic elements in it as well. So if I could be, you know, in a universe where I could perform magic, absolutely. Uh, and you best believe I would let Howell steal my heart any day. <laughs> What's the first anime you watched? So, okay, I think technically it was probably My Neighbor Totoro on VHS. I was truly obsessed with that movie when I was little. So much so that when it got redubbed by Dakota and Elle Fanning, it completely threw me off because the original dub was so ingrained into my memory. But in terms of my first anime series, it was Sailor Moon, which I, of course, absolutely adore to this day. Favorite Powerpuff Girl. 
I think when I was younger, Bubbles was my favorite because she reminded me of Baby Spice, who was my favorite Spice Girl at the time. They're like basically the same now that I think about it. <laughs> uh, but now I think it's Buttercup because I am a total sucker for fierce, feisty female characters. Plus, I always found it hilarious that at the end of the episode when, you know, they have got the heart motif at the end and they're all like cute and Buttercup is still smiling, but she looks so, she's got the angry eyebrows. <laughs> I just think it's so funny. If you could be a witch, what kind would you be? Okay, admittedly, the majority of my knowledge of witches comes from pop culture and media. Um, so my that's my that's my knowledge of witches. But if I were to choose, I think being some kind of elemental witch would be really cool. Uh, as we've learned, I'm obsessed with Avatar The Last Airbender, which of course does not contain witches in that universe. But um, I do think that there is something very intriguing and powerful about being able to manipulate the elements. So yeah, that is that's my choice. What's the next hair color gonna be? <laughs> um, so right now my hair color is a faded purple, but uh, I think when I re-dye it, I might be going for still a purple, but leaning more blue. We'll see. <laughs> What is one of the most cringy moments you've experienced? Oh my gosh, <laughs> going through all my cringy life moments and deciding which one to reveal to you guys was quite the journey, <laughs> but okay. So I don't have a specific incident for this, for this answer, but I will say throughout my preteen and high school years and even in my very early college years, I was always, always, always the third wheel. Many of my friends over the years would get a boyfriend or a girlfriend and instead of splitting up their time with me and their new partner, they would bring said partner to our hangouts. It was so infuriating and awkward and overall just made me feel incredibly lonely and pathetic. And this wasn't like one friend, this was multiple different friends throughout all of those years. <laughs> it would just happen over and over. And so now uh, I hate Valentine's Day. <laughs> would you rather have an extra toe on your hand or an extra finger on your foot? So, Originally, I wanted to pick the latter because I was like, oh, you know, no one sees my feet. But then I realized I'd rather actually have an extra toe on my hand because having an extra finger on your foot would make for wearing shoes a complete and total nightmare. Whereas with an extra toe on your finger, I feel like that would make very little difference. And if anything, it might make you more coordinated. Who knows? <laughs> What is your spirit animal and why? Okay, so two different animals came to mind. So the first one that came to mind was a red panda because I freaking love them and they're the cutest things on the planet. But I realized that that didn't really make sense for my spirit animal. So with more thought, I think that perhaps the chameleon is actually my spirit animal. Not because I am particularly fond of reptiles, but because uh, they can change colors and, you know, camouflage, which to me can equate to the fact that I think that I am pretty good at adapting to new challenges and environments. If this was a job interview, I think I would have freaking nailed that question. <laughs> but because this isn't a job interview, thank God, uh, I would also say that uh, another thing about chameleons is they they have you know each eye can be looking in different directions and i feel like that element of them correlates to the fact that i am a very very indecisive person uh and my brain is just always buzzing on about like a hundred different things at any given time 
I actually have a really hard time falling asleep most of the time because my brain just like won't shut up. <laughs> Favorite food to eat? For me, it's definitely a toss up between pad thai and banh mi. Basically, I really love Thai and Vietnamese food. They're my, they're definitely my favorites. There's, there's a couple of uh, different banh mi shops that I normally ate at like all the time, but because we're in quarantine, I haven't had them in ages because um, they're like too far from my apartment to, you know, order from. And I was really, really craving it. So I actually ended up pickling my own shredded carrots and making my own sandwiches. And while it's definitely not the same, I feel like it wasn't half bad and it kind of satiates my craving for now until um, I'm willing to venture out all the way over there. I'm assuming that they're probably open by now, but in any case. But I gotta say, even though I've just said that Vietnamese food is one of my favorites, um, when I went to uh, when I went traveling to Vietnam like a couple of years ago, and uh, I, we went for an entire month, and while the food is obviously amazing, um, I did find that like halfway through the trip, I was like, I just really want a slice of pizza right now. <laughs> I feel like in uh, Toronto in Canada, I'm so spoiled by being able to eat like so many different cuisines within you know one week even so yeah I found that um, I definitely favor a variety of things um, but you know if I have to narrow it down to my favorites it's got to be Vietnamese and Thai if you could only eat one type of pasta for the rest of your life what would it be I think the rotini, which is like the swirly noodles, I find that they have a really good sauce holding capability. <laughs> Rank waffles, pancakes, and French toast. Number one is definitely waffles. I like that they have that bit of crispiness on the outside and they got little pockets for syrup. Second would be French toast and last is pancakes. I actually really don't care for pancakes. Waffles and French toast I'm really into, but pancakes, nah, whatever. Is cereal soup? Okay, so I do see why one would debate this because it is partly liquid. However, I am going to say that no, cereal is not a soup because soup is meant to be served hot and savory which cereal is neither of those things. At what stage of ripeness do you like your bananas? I like them right between when they are no longer green, but they haven't started to get too much brown spotting yet. I really don't like overripe bananas. They're just too mushy. I'm not, I'm not into that texture. <laughs> What is your favorite kind of dessert? Okay, I freaking love dessert. And there was a couple questions about my favorite ice cream flavor, which I actually tackled in my last Q&A video. But yeah, ice cream is my absolute favorite. I will eat ice cream any time of the year. My favorite, 100%. Your favorite meme. <laughs> Uh, I freaking love memes. There are so many good ones out there. It took me a moment to narrow down which one was my favorite, but I think it's got to be the one with evil Kermit the Frog. <laughs> I remember dying, dying of laughter at the one when uh, Beyonce had announced she was having twins. Oh my God, just so funny. Uh, and also I really really love all the many rupaul's drag race memes that pop up on my explore page <laughs> basically my friend and i it, we just send drag race memes back and forth to each other all day every day it's it's so funny it's the best are you a roller coaster person yes Especially when I was a teenager, I was obsessed with roller coasters. Um, here in Ontario, we have this amusement park called Wonderland. 
Uh, and I remember one year, my friends and I actually got a season's pass, even though we don't even live very close to it. But I just, we loved going on roller coasters that much. And yeah, I don't, I don't personally watch horror movies. So it was definitely my way of feeling that rush of fear and adrenaline. But a couple of years ago, when I went to Universal Studios, um, I found that while I still enjoyed roller coasters, they definitely wore me out a lot quicker. AKA, I'm getting old and my body can only handle a few of them now. Uh, I feel like, yeah, during that trip, we spent most of our time in Disney World. Um, and then, you know, as you may have guessed, the rides in Disney are definitely more tame and it's more about the theming rather than being a thrill ride. And so when we went to uh, the, the Universal Studios for one day, we were extremely exhausted, like halfway through the day. Whereas at Disney, we could go, you know, be at the park from morning till night, no problem. But there was just with Universal, those rides are so intense that after like three of them, it was like, oh man, I need to take a break. <laughs> also, I got to say the Harry Potter section of Universal is definitely in my opinion, the only part worth, worth going back to. I wish that I could have just bought tickets for the Harry Potter section specifically. <laughs> Do you like traveling? If so, what are your favorite places to visit and the ones you'd love to see? I do. So as you might have just heard me talk about some traveling, <laughs> um, I mean, I will say I definitely haven't done as much traveling as I would have liked. Um, and there is definitely a lot of places that I've been to only once. So it's kind of hard to say like that they're my favorite place to visit. But I think that the places that I have the fondest memories of was my trip to Austin with my friend Kyung and my trip to Disney World with my friend Elise. Um, my trip to Austin, we had stayed at a hostel and everyone there was so friendly and really fun. The staff were awesome and we partied with a bunch of the other travelers that were staying there. And I remembered like being so hesitant to go because I didn't really know what to expect of, you know, two Asian girls traveling to Texas. <laughs> but uh, thankfully, everyone in Austin were so friendly. We didn't have a single bad encounter. It was it was really, really fun. I loved it. And then, of course, um, as you guys already heard me talk about, my trip to Disney World was freaking magical as hell. <laughs> my um, my friend and I never got to go when we were kids because um, our parents could just never afford family vacations like that. So it was a freaking blast getting to go as an adult. If you've seen our uh, drawing Disney characters from memory video, you'll probably know how much Disney is ingrained into our childhoods and at this point also into our adulthoods because we still watch a lot of those movies. Um, but yeah, getting to go as an adult also meant that we were able to drink, which made it extra fun. Starting out the morning with a mimosa, yes please. <laughs> and then, you know, having like a drink while we watch fireworks over the castle, like, oh, the best. Next, I really want to go to Japan. That is at the top of my bucket list for sure. And you know, when traveling is an option, I would definitely love to go someday. Uh, you know, the, the food, the shops, the locations, I'm probably, you know, if, when I get to go, I'll probably spend like all of my money there. Everything looks amazing. And pretty much all of my friends who've gone pretty, like they all say fantastic things about it. And I, yeah, so that is definitely, definitely, definitely on my bucket list. Are there things that Americans do that you find odd or interesting? Yes. Okay. This is something that I don't think is the case for all Americans. I'm just basing this is off of random knowledge that I've gotten in TV shows, but keeping your shoes on in the house. As far as I know, in Canada, you always take your shoes off when you're entering someone or your own home. Like you don't walk around in somebody's house or your own house with your shoes on. 
unless it's a wild college party, then that completely, that rule goes out the window. You absolutely have to keep your shoes on because that floor is going to get disgusting and there is a good chance if you take your shoes off, someone else will wear them home on purpose or by accident. <laughs> Do you have or want any tattoos? I don't have any tattoos, mostly because I have a very low pain tolerance and I am an incredibly indecisive person. The only tattoo that I've considered getting is the magic circles in Card Captain Sakura because the design is cool as hell and the series means a lot to me. Do you like Star Wars? Yes. I came into the Star Wars fandom fairly late. Um, when The Force Awakens first came out, I became intrigued. So before I went to see it, I went ahead and watched episodes four through six because, you know, I wanted to do it right. Uh, and yeah, I was really into it. Um, later on, I even went ahead and watched the prequels because I wanted to get in on the memes. And man, did they not disappoint? They are hilarious and very entertaining. <laughs> Also, I thoroughly enjoyed the Mandalorian series on Disney Plus as well. I am obsessed with Baby Yoda. Okay, last question. Who do you think should win Drag Race All-Stars 5? Okay, I am 1000% rooting for Shea Coulee. She has always been so freaking fierce and did so well during her season. If it weren't for the legendary lip, lip sync with Sasha Velour, I think she definitely would have won her season. She really has it all. She has great runway looks. She's hilarious in the challenge. She's very creative. She can make her own garments. Oh, she's amazing. I love her. Um, and then I'm also rooting for Jujubi. I've been a, she's been a big favorite of mine for a long time and I feel like she's just super underrated. And yeah, I'm glad that she's back. And I think that now we can hopefully finally see how freaking hilarious she is. And yeah, like her reads during the reading challenges are some of my favorites. So yeah, that brings us to the end of the video and Q and A. I got so many awesome questions from you guys. I apologize I didn't get to all of them. I actually have a bunch of them saved now for the next time I do another one, type, uh, one, another one of these videos. So um, yeah, I hope that you found this entertaining and I'm sending you all lots of positivity and encouragement and I will see you in the next one. Bye.